80-day journey around the world begins in New York City on January the 17th. The New York Post heralded the morning with headlines proclaiming it to be the coldest day of the century. New York is locked in a deep freeze of Arctic air and swirling snow and howling wind. And on the banks of the Hudson River, majestically moored to her frozen berth, is the city of the sea, our home for the next 80 days, the Queen Elizabeth II. She stands silent as the ice flows move upstream on the ocean tide. And by the end of the day, she will be completely frozen to the pier, and the tugs will have to cut her free to send her on her way. But in spite of the record cold, the pier is bustling with activity today as longshoremen load her hold with enough stores to last for 80 days at sea. There's a great sense of excitement here, for this entire ship must be fully loaded and stocked before sailing time at 4.45 this afternoon. John Bainbridge, executive chef, is inspecting steaks that are a part of a meat order that total over one million dollars. Tons of potatoes, flour, sugar, caviar, musical instruments, show costumes, everything from tissue paper to sterling silver is loaded in quantities that stagger the imagination. And while the lower pier rattles with the sound of trucks, the upper pier is filled with arriving limousines, tons of baggage, and excited passengers, each with a passport, a ticket, and dreams of anticipation. Inside the embarkation hall, there is magic in the air. 1,500 people from the four corners of the globe have gathered here in New York City to board this great ship for the cruise of a lifetime, an experience that will be filled with surprises, glamour, and discovery that only a world cruise on a great ship like the QE2 can possibly provide. The palm-lined red carpet tells us that we are leaving one world and joining another, a world that exists only on the high seas. And so let's prepare to embark on the greatest trip of all time. For what lies ahead is not only a great ship and a great adventure, but the very world itself. On the pier, thousands of well-wishers watch the final preparations as this great ship prepares to sail in frozen splendor this icy New York winter day. The horn blasts out and tells all New York we're on our way. And so say goodbye as Manhattan disappears. We're out to sea, and what lies ahead is an 80-day journey around the world aboard the QE2. We leave New York City on January the 17th and head south to our first port of call, still in the USA, Port Everglades, Florida. The decks are freezing cold our first night at sea, but 36 hours later, we pass Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, and join the warm and welcome Gulf Stream. The temperatures start to rise our first day at sea, and by Tuesday morning, January the 19th, the decks are as warm and inviting as the very Gold Coast of Florida that we are approaching. For nearly 200 miles, the east coast of Florida is a spectacular necklace of gleaming white condominiums catering to sun-seeking northerners who either temporarily or permanently invade the land that Ponce de Leon discovered in 1513 as he searched for the Fountain of Youth. Today the QE2 docks just long enough to board more passengers and give the onboard passengers a quick jeep train ride to the world famous Suncoast Resort of Miami Beach. Collins Avenue on the beach is an endless parade of luxury hotels, one more elaborate than the other. The warm waters and white soft sands have helped to make this one of the biggest and most palatial resorts of the great southeast. A favorite spot with winter weary northerners seeking out a bit of the January sun. But our time is short today and we must hurry back to the QE2 because tonight at sunset we sail on into the Caribbean and the real beginning of our warm weather cruise. It's Wednesday, our fourth day at sea. We are in the Caribbean, and passengers are already starting to work on their most prized souvenir, a tan that will provoke blasphemous envy from their acquaintances at home. This is also a great time to start making new friends. Wonderful new friends are one of the greatest things cruise ships can offer. There is something about the confined nature of the sea that breaks down social barricades and even the most timid passenger will return from a cruise with wonderful new friends.
And as the social life gets underway, the QE2 steams on into the Caribbean in our second port of call, the island of Martinique. Sunrise on the Caribbean. It's as warm and inviting as our port of call today. But this is a tinder port, an anchorage. The harbor at Martinique is far too shallow for the QE2 to dock. So the ship anchors offshore. The lifeboats are lowered and serve as tenders to shuttle passengers back and forth for a day of sightseeing and fun. So hold on to your hat. We're headed for Fort de France and Martinique. Martinique, it's exotic, tropical, a paradise of green, and it is a part of France. Martinique is not a colony, not a territory, not a possession. It is a state of France. It is to France what Hawaii is to the United States. But the language is slightly different, the music calypso, and all in all the flavor is pure tropics. Warm, lazy, quiet, but not always so. In the background is Mount Pele, and what appears to be a dry riverbed was a raging lava flow in 1902 when this volcano erupted and destroyed the town of Saint-Pierre. This ruin was a lovely church, and it was filled with Sunday morning worshipers the hour the volcano exploded. Today the ruin is a reminder of that tragic and awesome event. Martinique is a near Eden of tropical plants. Beautiful banana trees, poinsettias, and other lovely tropical flowers and blossoms give Martinique a garden-like quality here in the midst of the Caribbean Sea. Martinique, it is blessed with sun and rain, glorious beaches, and tropical forests, and it offers great rewards to the winter Caribbean traveler. But we must hurry back to the pier and catch the last tender to the ship, because tonight the QE2 sails on, just a short distance, 125 miles, to the coral reef island of Barbados. Steel bands welcome us ashore to this, the most eastwardly of the Caribbean chain, where the Atlantic and the Caribbean meet. Barbados is a delightful blend of Caribbean culture and British reserve, because Barbados was under British rule for nearly 300 years. In 1966, independence was granted, and Barbados became an entity of its own. But many of the age-old traditions from London continue to hang on, and today the island has a curious cultural blend not unlike that of the Bahamas. The people of Barbados are very proud of their home, which they describe as 21 miles long and a smile wide. Barbados has a rather checkered past. This is Sam Lord's Castle, and it was the home of the true island rogue, a pirate who built his wealth by luring and then looting ships aground on the reef. One of the things that Barbados is best known for are its flowers. Beautiful orchids are one of the calling cards of this garden spot on the eastern edge of the Caribbean Sea. But the economy of Barbados is built on this, sugar. The entire island is one giant sugarcane field. Every square inch of plowable land is planted in cane, and island children learn early that fresh-cut cane is a free and a ready treat. On the eastern shore, the wide Atlantic crashes into the reef to create some of the most spectacular surf in the world. On this island, where you have too many fingers on your hand, to count the number of days each year that the sun doesn't shine. Barbados, it's a delightful blend of the tropics and tradition, and it's our second port of call on the great world cruise. From Barbados, we now sail south towards Rio. It's our 10th day at sea, and this afternoon it is time to cross the line, because today we are going to sail over the equator and into the southern hemisphere. And tradition dictates a ceremony, the court of King Neptune. The court is now in session and ready to initiate, in the most thoroughly bizarre fashion imaginable, those who have never crossed the line before. 
Before you panic though and think that your hard-earned money has bought you this, take heart, for the passengers it is purely voluntary. But for the crew such is not the case. Crew members who have only sailed transatlantic before and have never been over the line have been known to hide out in broom closets to avoid the ordeal. But it's all in fun and it's a tradition on any world cruise. So prepare to get wet and welcome to the Southern Hemisphere. From the equator, we now steam south to our first South American port of call, the intriguing city of Salvador. Here on the coast of the Brazilian Colossus stands a city so Portuguese that Lisbon could almost be next door. This was the capital of Portuguese America until the 18th century. The beautiful Baroque buildings tell of fortunes made in the gold and diamond mines. 365 massive Baroque churches, one for each day of the year, make this city a museum of the New World Renaissance. But beneath the Catholic facade is another world. Magic men and voodoo practitioners make this the center of Candombele, the Brazilian spiritualism that combines elements of Christianity and tribal mysticism. For Salvador is not Rio. Its people are of African descent, their culture not Latin, and the markets of this city pulsed with the rhythms of these people who have made this such an unusual and intriguing port of call. Today the wealth of Salvador is built on cocoa. Each year a billion dollars worth of cocoa moves out of this port on the northern coast of Brazil. The waterfront markets are very busy today as QE2 supply agents purchase fresh fruits and vegetables for the ship. Fruits and vegetables are bought throughout the world cruise, and many of the exotic items are then served on the midnight buffet once the ship leaves port. From Salvador we now return to sea. We are steaming southwest along the Atlantic coast. We are en route to one of the world's classic jewels, the city of the River of January, the home of Copacabana, the place where three letters mean magic, Rio. From high atop Corcovado, we peer down onto one of the greatest cities of the world. And from down below, we look back to one of the greatest sights of the world, the Christ the Redeemer statue, 120 feet tall, its arms outstretched as if blessing this very blessed spot. But the real life of Rio is down below, on the beach, Copacabana, the most famous beach in the world. In Rio, nothing really counts unless you're on the beach. The throngs who flock here during the Brazilian summer are living life the way Brazilians feel God intended it to be lived, on the beach and in the sun. And the result of all of this outdoor activity is the single most handsome population on earth. The people of Rio are tan, healthy, they live in the sun and gaze out onto a harbor and a city blessed unlike any other spot of the world. But out of the sun is another side of Rio that sparkles as well. Diamonds, emeralds, rubies, for Rio is one of the great gem centers of the world. Here at H. Stern, Rio's leading jeweler, artisans cut and polish the stones using skills that have been handed down from generation to generation. Jewels are an excellent value here. Many are mined in the Brazilian interior and U.S. Customs law allows duty-free importation. The prices are actually quite reasonable for the quality of goods involved. So who could resist? Many World Cruise passengers didn't. And here are some of the pieces that were brought back on board the ship the night that we sailed. Rio has three world-renowned landmarks, Corcovado, Copacabana, and this granite monolith known as Sugarloaf. This granite mountain protruding from the bay is Rio's most famous symbol. So let's board the cable car, ride to the summit, and take one last look out over this jewel of the South Atlantic, the home of Samba, Carnival, and the happy life, Rio.
Rio de Janeiro. From Rio, we are back to sea, sailing on one of our longest legs, five days across the South Atlantic to the Cape of Good Hope. During these leisurely days at sea, we have an opportunity to relax and enjoy some of the good life a ship can provide. We've been at sea for two weeks now, and this evening it's time for the captain's cocktail party, a tradition of any cruise. Passengers are always given a chance to meet the man at the helm. And in addition to meeting the captain, you'll also have an opportunity to see the diversity in the passenger list. World cruises attract the most colorful and interesting people in the world. As the party progresses, Captain Peter Jackson will step to the front of the room. He gathers the senior staff about him and uses this opportunity to introduce all of the senior officers and report on the progress of the ship at sea. And after the cocktail party, the passengers will head to the dining rooms. The QE2 has four separate dining rooms, large enough to accommodate all passengers in one sitting. The ship carries fewer passengers on world cruise than she does on transatlantic crossings, so everyone can be seated leisurely in one sitting. And leisure, along with elegance, are two of the key words at sea. Every night at sea is formal. The tuxedos, the evening gowns, and the jewels are all very much a part of this wonderfully elegant world. And after dinner, you can head to the Grand Lounge for dancing to one of the QE2's orchestras, or if you're more in the mood just to watch, you can head to the late night cabaret in the Queen's Room. Every night, lavish cabaret reviews unfold, complete with showgirls, costumes, and stars. Tonight, Roy and Jackie Todoff entertain. This is their 20th year at sea for the Cunard Line, and they've done every world cruise of the QE2. The five days pass quickly, and we are now arriving in the city of Cape Town. It is our 21st day at sea, dawn, and we are approaching Africa. The stillness is broken by the sound of a helicopter. QE2's master rarely guides the ship into local waters. Pilots board to navigate the local channels. Normally, they board by a pilot boat, but here in South Africa, the pilots board by helicopter. And one hour later, with the assistance of these two men, the QE2 is moored downtown in front of one of Africa's most interesting cities, Cape Town. As the morning draws on, the tablecloth drapes over Table Mountain. This often present layer of clouds is a familiar sight on this beacon of the South African shipping route. Cape Town today is a bustling city that reflects 300 years of settlement. On the Grand Parade, thousands of Cape Towners turn out on Saturday mornings for a market that sells everything imaginable. And here you can see some of the diversity in the population, a diversity which gives South Africa its unique flavor and also many of its problems. The nation is officially bilingual, and most of the residents speak both English and Afrikaans, a language which is similar to Dutch. Cape Town is a result of many different things, but it is particularly a reflection of Dutch influence. Beautiful, gabled buildings sparkle in the summer sun and give an interesting visual appearance to this city at the tip of the African continent. It was also the Dutch who first recognized that the Mediterranean-like climate would be ideal for the growing of grapes. Stellenbosch, outside of Cape Town, is the center of an industry South Africa is known for the world over, fine wines. The first cuttings were brought to South Africa nearly 300 years ago. They took to the soil and the sun beautifully, and in time, South African wines became the preferred wines of choice in European court circles. But South Africa is known for many other things as well, including wildlife. 
Well, they have their wildlife in the wild, and they also have it right downtown. These baboons are among the most brazen creatures alive. They will beg, borrow, and more frequently steal anything edible. They can be cute, amusing, and nerve-wracking, and they are very much a part of the Cape Town scene. This fellow has decided that it's time to move on, and so shall we. The QE2 is going to sail around the Cape of Good Hope, but some of the passengers are going to leave the ship for a few days and journey inland. First, South African Airlines takes us north to Johannesburg. We then fly on into the Transvaal and the heart of the South African bush. No one should visit South Africa without a trip to the Transvaal. To see these animals in their natural setting, roaming free, the way God intended them to be, is truly a thrilling experience. South Africa has some of the greatest variety of wildlife left on the African continent today. And while two centuries of unchecked shooting have certainly taken their toll, South Africa today leads almost all other African nations in sound game management. The result is a stable, healthy animal population roaming free. And today you can explore their world on their terms and experience something which is truly unique and very special. But of all of South Africa's wildlife, none is quite as special as what our guide searched out for us today. In the late afternoon, along a dusty road, we found the King of Beasts, a male and a female resting quietly at the end of the day. The scene is so peaceful and yet so dangerous. I can't begin to convey the sense of awe in standing here. And it helps to prove what South Africans say, that theirs is a world in one country with unrivaled variety for the visitor. From the Transvaal, we now fly down to Durban, reboard the ship, and sail on into the Indian Ocean and the island of Mauritius. Of all of our ports of call, this island in the Indian Ocean is probably the least known. It is on almost exactly the opposite side of the world. It is a quiet, beautiful island of waterfalls, tropical rainforests, and Eden-like splendor blessed with sunshine and a near-perfect climate, one of the truly peaceful spots of a very busy world. Mauritius has an interesting history. At Port Louis, the island capital, stands the Parliament House, and in front, a statue of Queen Victoria, which of course tells us that the British were here. But the Mauritian people are very different. They are primarily a blend of Indian and Chinese, and they have a distinctive appearance all their own. Three great religions flourish in this nation, Buddhism, Islam, and Hinduism. This colorful Hindu temple is one of many such temples to be found throughout this interesting island nation. Mauritius is also somewhat known for its lovely gardens. The Royal Pamplemousse Gardens, north of Port Louis, are known by botanists the world over for their outstanding collection of palms and plants, including the giant Victoria Regia lilies, each three to six feet wide and nurtured as national treasures in this island nation. One of the other things that Mauritius is somewhat known for is an interesting cottage industry, the building of model boats. Not just any model boats, but perfect, exact-scaled replicas of the great sailing ships of history. 
Here at Cure Peep in the island interior, 120 Mauritians work constantly to produce these exact scaled models. The workmanship is considered the finest in the world for the product being produced. Over 400 hours of labor go into the production of each of these individual model boats. Our stay in Mauritius was very brief, but for many passengers, this was one of the interesting surprises of the great world cruise. From Mauritius, we now return to sea. We're steaming northeast, back across the equator in route to Asia. A great ship is not all entertainment and glamour. It's a floating city, and much goes on unseen by the passengers. On the bridge, Captain Peter Jackson charts our course through the Indian Ocean. He is a very busy man, for he has full responsibility for this 67,000 ton vessel, for he is the master of the QE2. Once the course has been charted, the information is then given to the senior officers who will relay the orders. And the wheel of the QE2 will then be manned by this young sailor. And the wheel of the ship, a gigantic affair? Well, I'm afraid not. This is the wheel of the QE2. The 80-ton rudder is, of course, maneuvered by power steering. The engine panel is push-button, but with the traditional full speed ahead, dead slow, and so forth. Down below in the engine room, the operation is extremely sophisticated. The QE2 is the last word in technology. Her engines are completely computerized. When the ship leaves port, data is fed into the computers regarding the distance to be covered, the scheduled time of arrival, wind and ocean currents, and a dozen other factors. The engines then go to work to operate at peak efficiency. This is the ballast room. The QE2 carries 6,000 tons of diesel fuel and uses 500 tons of fuel a day. That fuel is stored in tanks on both the port and the starboard sides. And this man's job is to monitor how the fuel is drawn out, so the ship is always righted. He will also handle the safety panels. These panels monitor fire detectors, sprinkler systems, and watertight doors. Safety is never taken for granted at sea. Tied into safety is the radio room. This man keeps the ship in constant contact with shore installations and nearby ships at sea. And when he isn't doing priority ship business, he will put your personal phone call through. We are in the Indian Ocean today, and he is connecting passengers to family and friends in the USA, Britain, and Japan. When the calls are ready, the operators will patch them into the cabins. It's all a part of the unseen world on board the QE2. From Mauritius, we have now steamed back across the equator to the city of Colombo, the capital of Ceylon, known today as Sri Lanka, the resplendent land. And here we receive our first exposure to Buddhism, a religion that influences all of Asia, and a religion that has a strong and important historic significance in this island nation. Saffron-robed monks with shaved heads are a common and an accepted sight in this capital city. Surrounding the capital are farms where the agricultural methods have changed remarkably little. The rice is still winnowed by hand in this country where modern machinery, capable of speeding the task, is simply too costly to buy. One of the most interesting features of life in Sri Lanka is the continued use of elephants as beasts of burden. These elephants are bathed, cared for, pampered and groomed because the investment is high and abuse would be foolish. This man has owned this elephant for decades and no child has ever been spoiled more. But these great creatures do work, and they work very hard. Their main job is to move lumber, and it is an irony that their work is helping to destroy the forests that make up their habitat and home. For it is the dwindling forest that poses the greatest threat to the survival of the Asian elephant. 
But Sri Lanka has done more to protect these creatures than almost any other nation of the world. This country can be very proud of a deep sensitivity to the survival of these great and glorious beasts. From the lowland areas, we now journey high into the mountains to a city that is as close to Shangri-La as you can come on this earth, for we're en route to the ancient capital of Kandy. In the center of Kandy is the great temple of the tooth, and inside the temple, encased in gold, is the tooth of Buddha, rescued from the burning funeral pyre and brought here for veneration. This is one of the holiest spots in the world for a religion that influences all of Asia today. But Kandy is known for many other things as well. Clean mountain air, bustling crowds, colorful markets, unusual museums, and of course the world famous Kandyan dancers. These young men will, in addition to their dances, offer up displays of fire eating, an ancient Selenese skill. From Kandy, we now return to the ship and sail out at sunset across the Gulf of Manar to the subcontinent of India and the city of Madras on the eastern shore of one of the world's largest and most fascinating countries. A trip to India is an eye-opening experience and an experience which should be had by any serious traveler for a complete understanding of the world. For here is another world a world of people living largely in what we would regard as poverty and want, and depending on your viewpoint, either contented or resigned to their situation in life. Here is a land where things don't always get better, and here is a place where such concepts as ours of Western prosperity are often very far removed from reality. And yet India is also a fascinating country. Bicycles, taxis, Brahma bulls pulling overloaded carts, part 20th century, part Stone Age. Men, women, children, animals, machinery, all struggling to survive and succeed. And there are things about India that we cannot understand. India is predominantly a Hindu nation. Reincarnation is the cornerstone of their hope. The cow is sacred, the female, not the bull and allowed to roam the streets freely, eating anything she sees and wishes. It is an exotic, unusual, very different world. And nothing in all of India, or all the world, is quite as exotic as this, the Taj Mahal. This is the world's greatest sight. It was begun in 1631 by the Emperor Shah Jahan as a memorial to his most beloved wife, Mumtaz. 20,000 laborers worked for 22 years to complete the project, and the result is simply unparalleled on Earth. A building of perfect scale, detail and balance, a monument of absolute perfection in the midst of one of the world's most fascinating countries. From the Taj Mahal, we fly back to Madras, reboard the ship, and sail out across the Bay of Bengal, en route to our next destination, the capital of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. At Kuala Lumpur, the QE2 truly receives a royal welcome, because the Sultan of Selangor, one of our world cruise passengers, is being greeted ashore by his subjects. And all of this is being done for lunch. The Sultan will have lunch at his palace and then return to the ship to complete the rest of the world cruise. While the Sultan is having lunch at his palace, we're going to explore this interesting city. In spite of its somewhat exotic sounding name, Kuala Lumpur is one of Asia's more modern cities. The country is substantially Muslim rather than Buddhist, and mosques and Moorish architecture abound. 
Kuala Lumpur has one of the higher standards of living in Asia today. And equal to the height of the standard of living is the heat and the humidity, for this is one of the world's steamiest spots. And the foundation of all of this wealth? Well, the original wealth came out of trees, rubber trees. Each morning, before the heat stops the sap from rising, these men will tap the trees. A small trough is placed under the tap, a tin can under the trough, and several hours later, they will come back and collect a small puddle of latex. It seems like a rather inefficient means of doing the work, but no one has ever come up with a more practical method of gathering the rubber in this nation where natural rubber is still king. From Kuala Lumpur, we now steam south through the Straits of Malacca to the tip of Malaysia and the independent Republic of Singapore. Rising from the sea is one of the 20th century's greatest miracles, Singapore. This city of steel bears little resemblance to the seamy port that so enamored Bill Bailey that a song had to be written to bring him back home. Raffles Hotel has become legendary the world over for having invented the famous gin drink, the Singapore Sling. But Singapore would prefer to be known as the Garden City, and it is a reputation that it truly lives up to. Beautiful gardens filled with architectural details and lovely tropical blossoms create a sense of calm here in the midst of the great Asian hub. Singapore is one of the world's busiest ports and it is also one of the world's best run cities. And these beautiful gardens are only one example of the high standards by which this city functions. The Chinese and Japanese gardens offer a bit of peace and serenity, whereas the Tiger Bomb Gardens offers one of the world's oddest whimsies. This curious collection of creatures and figures was the project of two brothers who manufactured Tiger Bomb, an all-purpose oriental salve intended to cure everything from bursitis to headaches. In the days before mass advertising, this park was created by this company as a goodwill gesture to offer a bit of amusement in an oddly oriental way. But Singapore also has a refined sense of culture as well, much of it Chinese in nature. The lion dance is a part of any Singapore cultural show. And to give world cruise passengers a taste of the Chinese and Malay performing skills, the Cunard Line has brought on board a performing troupe to present a cultural show in the Queen's Room just before we sail. It's one of the many port offerings on the great world cruise of the QE2. Dancers leave the ship and we sail on into the Gulf of Thailand. The weather is warm, the sea breeze pleasant, and this is an excellent opportunity to enjoy some deck activities. You can play a few games of shuffleboard, always a popular activity at sea, or you might want to brush up on your golf swing. The QE2 employs a full-time golf pro who will help you work on your swing and master the techniques. Or you might like to try your hand at skeet shooting. Each day the passengers line up and give it a try as the clay pigeons sail out over the stern of the ship. And after you've had an opportunity to enjoy some skeet shooting, shuffleboard and golf, you can jog, swim, join an exercise class, go to the gym, and then totally destroy all of your health-oriented efforts on the noon buffet. For lunch you can relax in the dining room or indulge yourself on the deck buffet. Since all food is included in the price of the cruise, some of us have a tendency to get carried away. And by this point in the cruise, there were many passengers on board who had absolutely no clothes left that they could still get into. The one universal certainty about world cruise passengers is they will all go on a diet once the ship returns home. But it sure is fun while it lasts.
Every night is showtime on the QE2. And tonight in the Queen's Room, here in the mystical East, Edwin Heath, one of the world's most renowned hypnotists, will take us into another world. Passengers volunteer for the experience, which is fun and baffling to everyone involved. This passenger is used to show the power of suggesting no pain. And then Edwin Heath shows just how deep a trance can be, as he tells a subject to stiffen his back, puts him between two chairs, and has the passenger demonstrate just how real the trance can be. It is an amazing and fascinating show, and another night of entertainment on board the QE2. From Singapore, we have now steamed north into the Gulf of Thailand to our next port of call, the city of Bangkok. Bangkok actually lies inland, and our ship docks at Pattaya. We then travel overland three hours to one of the world's most exotic cities, Bangkok. Bangkok is a jewel of temples, spires, dragons, and giants, all symbolic of the type of Buddhism practiced in this part of Asia. Among Bangkok's more notable attractions are its 300 temples, or wats as they are better known, scattered throughout the city. These colorful temples are all decorated with broken porcelain. In the 19th century, boatloads of porcelain were making their way to the west. Damage was high, and the broken porcelain was used to decorate these monuments of faith which you see today. Produce sellers set up their stalls on the streets and sell their products to the passing customers. But much of the commerce of Bangkok does not take place on the streets, but rather in the canals. Because Bangkok is like Venice, a city dissected by hundreds of canals, here called klongs. They are the thoroughfares of commerce. And so let's take a ride through the floating markets of Bangkok and see some of the true Thai life in this, our 14th port of call on the Great World Cruise. Bangkok is known for its canals, its temples, and also its sports. This is Thai boxing, the official sport of the country, and not a game for the timid, because Marquis of Queensbury rules do not apply. All limbs are considered weapons, and feet become lethal tools in this ancient oriental skill. But in spite of this seemingly vicious sport, the Thai people are actually very gentle by nature, and saffron-robed monks are a common sight here at the royal palace. This is one of the greatest sights of the world. It rivals the Taj Mahal. Reds, blues, golds, all joined together into a symphony of color in this, the most imposing monument of the Far East. This is our 40th day, the halfway point in the Great World Cruise. We left the ice and snow of New York City nearly six weeks ago, but half of the world lies ahead. And so let's return to the ship at Pattaya and prepare to head north because the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong awaits. It is our 41st day at sea. For the first time since leaving New York City, we encounter cool gray weather. We are leaving the tropics, and from Bangkok, we move north through the South China Sea to the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. Nestled along the China coast is the island of Hong Kong, the true meeting place of the East and the West. No city of the world combines the Occidental and Oriental so well. The Star Ferry operates continuously between the mainland peninsula of Kowloon and Hong Kong Island. 
but we have arrived late in the day. The sun is going down and the lights are coming on up and down Nathan Road. Hong Kong after dark is truly a magical spot. The neon signs sparkle and invite the locals and visitors alike into the great restaurants, discos and supper clubs of Nathan Road. Hong Kong's best known activity is of course shopping, for this is one of the world's great duty-free ports. Bargains are everywhere, high quality jade, beautiful porcelain, precious stones, watches, jewelry, cameras, radios, tape recorders, everything imaginable at some of the world's lowest prices, in this the great duty-free port of the Far East. But the real allure of Hong Kong after dark is to be found in the supper clubs of Nathan Road, where lavish cultural shows unfold each night. And as you watch the shows unfold on stage, you can dine on the great Chinese specialties, pressed Peking duck, barbecued pigeon, and all sorts of other exotic delicacies, which taste considerably better when you don't actually know what's in them. And as you struggle with your chopsticks, the shows continue to unfold on stage with ribbon dances and bits and pieces of great Chinese opera. The following morning, we leave Kowloon and head across the harbor and around Hong Kong Island to the village of Aberdeen, the floating city, home to a quarter of a million people who live permanently on the boats. This is one of Hong Kong's best known attractions. And when you visit here, you must remember that most of these people live here by choice. They have spent their lives on these boats and the high rise apartments on the shore would be an alien environment to them. The QE2 puts into Hong Kong for five days. This gives passengers a chance to thoroughly explore the colony, and it also gives Cunard an opportunity to do an annual project, the painting of the ship. Each year, the QE2 is completely painted top to bottom in Hong Kong. There is another group that is also very busy at work in Hong Kong, and they are, of course, the tailors of the city. Custom tailored suits are one of Hong Kong's best buys, and as soon as the ship docked, hundreds of passengers headed immediately to the tailor shops to pick out materials, be measured, have fittings, and they will pick up finished suits before we sail. Hong Kong tailors are among the best in the world, and they are also among the fastest. If necessary, a suit can be produced on 24 hours notice and no man should leave Hong Kong without at least one custom tailored suit. George Chin in the Peninsula Hotel is one of Hong Kong's best known tailors and he has his cutters, sewers and fitters working overtime until we sail. We're back to sea, this time steaming north along the China coast. The weather is cool, the sea breeze pleasant, and this is an excellent opportunity to enjoy some indoor activities on board the ship. You can relax leisurely in an interior deck chair, or you can enjoy any one of innumerable activities offered on board the ship each day. There are card games to be played, gin rummy tournaments, and bridge classes conducted by the professionals. If the weather is a little cool outside, you might enjoy playing a few games of ping pong on one of the interior decks. And if you're the betting type but don't want your stakes to be too high, well then you can put a dollar on the daily tote and guess how many miles the ship has traveled in the last 24 hours. There's a Barclays Bank to change your money, a florist shop to prepare bouquets for you and your friends, a well-stocked library where understandably the best read books are of course on the subject of travel, as well as a complete beauty salon, barber shop, and masseur. And here in the beauty salon, you can have your hair done just right by any one of 10 professional stylists who work permanently on board the QE2. And after you've had your hair done, you can step upstairs and enjoy a little serious music in the theater. 
This afternoon, the Curtis Quartet is presenting a concert of Brahms and Beethoven. And after you've enjoyed some serious music, well, you can step downstairs and join the cha-cha class, where Keith and Judy Clifton will do everything in their power to make you a master of the cha-cha-cha. And believe me, they've got quite a job on their hands with the lady in red. Big orchestras and ballroom dancing are still very much a part of life at sea, and the dance classes help to make it more fun for everyone involved. If you fancy yourself as a gourmet cook, you can learn from the professionals. Pierre Franet and Craig Claiborne, both of the New York Times, are on board to give cooking demonstrations with recipes that are fun to make, always delicious, and guaranteed to please your guests. These activities, and many others, are a part of any world cruise on the QE2. We have now steamed from Hong Kong to the port city of Pusan, in the nation of Korea, land of the morning calm. It is March, still cool, and several weeks before spring arrives in this Asian nation. And today we are going to journey inland to the community of Kongju, where in the eastern mountains of Korea stands a complex of temples which date back centuries. And we are indeed fortunate today to have timed our arrival with one of Buddhism's most sacred holidays, the anniversary of the death of Buddha. This holiday is to Buddhists what Holy Week would be to Christians. Hundreds of Korean people arrive in traditional dress to explore the great halls of Konju and pay homage to their religious figure. This is also a favorite spot to have your photograph taken and the courtyards, stairs and halls are an endless parade of people posing in front of these majestic monuments here in the eastern mountains of Korea at Kongju. After we have had an opportunity to explore these interesting temples, we can pause for a leisurely lunch before returning to the ship in the late afternoon. And lunch in Korea is a very special thing. Today we join two Koreans at a low table covered with 27 different dishes, each exotic, spicy, delicate, reflecting the culinary skills and traditions of the Korean people. From Pusan, we now sail overnight through the Sea of Japan to the island of Kyushu and the Japanese port city of Kagoshima. And as soon as the QE2 tied up at the pier, we were greeted with the most colorful arrival ceremony so far on the Great World Cruise. People from throughout southern Japan came to greet us to Japan's southernmost port city. I found this nation one of the marvelous surprises of the cruise. The Japanese people are warm, hospitable, friendly, they love Westerners, and their sense of warmth is truly infectious. During our stay in Kagoshima, World Cruise passengers had an opportunity to see some notable landmarks, including Sakurajima. This smoking, belching volcano spews steam and ash into the air an average of 360 days of the year. It almost never stops and to stand at the base of this erupting volcano is well worth the visit to this southern port city of Japan. From the base of the volcano, we now journey by ferry boat across the harbor to the Isu Gardens to observe a quieter side of Japanese life as is exemplified in the traditional tea ceremony. For here in one of the world's most heavily industrialized nations, the old traditions still linger on. This lovely kimono-clad woman prepares the tea using slow, methodical movements, each of which is important to the ceremony as a whole. And as you watch this very solemn event, you grow to understand some of the multifaceted characteristics 
of this unusual nation and these very interesting people. Once the tea has been prepared, it is very carefully served to the world cruise passengers, who may be slightly puzzled by the whole affair, but who have had an opportunity to observe a thousand years of Japanese tradition. We are now back to sea, steaming north to our next port of call, the capital city of Tokyo. In the center of Tokyo stands the great Imperial Palace, home to the Emperor Akihito. It is a quiet, park-like setting in the midst of one of the world's biggest and busiest cities. It is spring in Japan, cherry and plum blossoms add color at every turn. But the real heart of Tokyo is here, the Ginza, the Four Chome, the Four Corners, the busiest intersection in this, one of the biggest and busiest cities of the world. I have never been to a city outside of New York where I felt the sense of life and vitality on the streets that you find here in the Japanese capital of Tokyo. At Asakusa on the northern side of Tokyo, thousands of people gather in a festive mood on Sunday mornings at this great Buddhist temple. But to understand the religious nature of the Japanese people, we're going to board a train in downtown Tokyo and journey a short distance south to the quiet, peaceful community of Kamakura. Kamakura, immediately south of Tokyo, is one of the great religious centers of Japan. Here, Shinto shrines, Zen centers, and Buddhist temples all stand side by side. This young Japanese man purchases a good luck ribbon, which he will tie onto the trellis along with thousands of others. The religious nature of the Japanese people is sometimes misunderstood by the Westerner. But the Japanese know exactly what they are doing, just as they have since the days when this, the great Kamakura Buddha, was cast. This 66-foot-tall bronze Buddha stares down serenely to the sea. It is one of the greatest sights of the world and something that should be seen by any visitor to Japan. In the same way that Christ influenced the Near East and in time the West, Buddha influenced all of the Far East. And to truly understand the Oriental mind, one should understand some of the philosophy of this important figure of religious history. Tokyo by day may be very interesting, but by night it's another world. Tokyo has the biggest and busiest neon signs in the world outside of Las Vegas, and a walk through the Ginza after dark will quickly convince you that this is one of the world's most cosmopolitan cities. Disco dancing abounds. The Japanese have tried everything Western except the game of cricket, and Tokyo stands today as a monument to Western influence here in the Far East. And how will they get about for their night on the town? Well, for the average person, it's still the subway. Tokyo has one of the best subway systems in the world, and a ride on this system will give you a chance to observe the Japanese people in a very ordinary and daily situation. This 10-line system fans throughout the city and is a joy to ride, except during rush hour, when the crowds become so monumental that they employ people known as stuffers whose job it is to stuff the crowds far enough into the cars so that they can get the doors closed. But even in the midst of the afternoon crush, the Japanese retain their calm and dignified manner. And what will they do for their night on the town? Well, Tokyo offers many different things, including pachinko, a favorite game with the Japanese. Pachinko is played in parlors. You go into the parlor, you purchase a box of steel balls, you insert them into this machine, they then drop at random, accumulating a score. You have absolutely no control over it whatsoever. If you win, you'll get something exciting, like a bar of soap. Pachinko is noisy, fast, mesmerizing, and the Japanese adore it. And another thing they adore are ships. During our stay in the Tokyo port city of Yokohama, this line never ended. 
hundreds of thousands of people filed by just to look at the QE2. And when we sailed, this was the scene on the pier. 250,000 people came to wish us bon voyage. And as you look out over this crowd, as far as the eye can see, you quickly realize that this is indeed the greatest ship in the world. We're back to sea, this time sailing on our longest leg, six days across the western Pacific en route to Hawaii. And once again we cross a milestone, this time the international dateline. And just as traditional as the court of King Neptune on the equator is the tug of war on the dateline. This was a real madhouse today because the seas were very rough and the ship was rolling and pitching, but it didn't stop the fun. And the next day it's time for another world cruise tradition, the white elephant sail. We've now been to 17 ports and everyone has purchased at least one souvenir they should never have bought. So the ship holds an auction to sell it all. The stuff doesn't disappear, it simply changes hands. While you're enjoying the good life at sea, this man will attend to your cabin needs. His name is Ken Ford and he is one of 100 cabin stewards on board the QE2. He'll make your bed, fluff your pillows, and keep your cabin tidy, and he'll also bring you breakfast in bed. Ken has been sailing for the Cunard Line for more years than he's willing to admit. He started off on the Great Queen Mary, and when you ask him about his life at sea, his face glows with stories of the unusual and colorful people that he has known and served. Among his many different jobs are delivering the ship's newspaper and the daily program. The QE2 Times is the ship's paper, and the daily program will list all of the entertainment and lectures on board each day. On this particular cruise, you would have had an opportunity to hear Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the author of The Power of Positive Thinking, or Rex Reed, syndicated columnist for the New York Post and one of America's foremost movie critics, and a favorite passenger on the QE2. For opinions on newsmakers of the world, Harry Reisner of CBS's 60 Minutes offers his opinions at sea. And to put it into a perspective of humor, Art Buckwald of the Washington Post. Ruby Keeler, star of Warner Brothers and one of the first actresses to appear in an all-singing, all-dancing motion picture, 42nd Street, joins us for 60 days of the great world cruise. And in the showroom, Iris Williams, one of Britain's top recording stars, appears in a dazzling stage review that will also feature Theodore Bickell, Broadway star of Fiddler on the Roof. These people and many others were a part of our QE2 family on this world cruise. The six days passed quickly and we are now arriving in Honolulu. Hawaii is perhaps still the greatest vacation spot in America. The soft sands of Waikiki Beach beckon the sun seekers and beautiful new hotels dot the shoreline. And as soon as you have a chance to shed that sweater that you've been wearing across the western Pacific, you can slip into a bathing suit and join the scene on the beach at Waikiki. still the land of the beautiful people. Dark brown tans and sun bleached hair are as much a part of this scene as the ever-present surfboard. Surfing is of course the number one sport in Hawaii and if you're visiting here you can take a few lessons, try a few gentle waves and eventually you may be ready to try the roaring surf on the north shore of Oahu. <laughs> Perhaps you're not ready to try your hand at surfing just yet, but maybe you would like to try your hand at the hula. 
Well, there's no better place to see how it's all done than at the Kodak Hula Show at Kapiolani Park, off the beach at Waikiki. This show is sponsored several times a week free by the Eastman Kodak Company. Well, it actually isn't free at all, because the gimmick is to get you to take an awful lot of pictures and use up an awful lot of film. But in spite of the somewhat commercial motives, it is colorful, and it does give you a chance to see all of the different Hawaiian dances. I'm sure that you've heard this a thousand times before, but I'm going to repeat it once again. You keep your eyes on the hands, because the hands tell the story. But to appreciate the true beauty of Hawaii, you need to leave the beaches of Honolulu and journey to the out islands or the back roads of Oahu. And so let's pause for just a moment and take a look at what time, nature, and the hand of God were able to create in this incomparably beautiful wilderness that we have come to know today as Hawaii. To try and describe the beauty of these islands is a task that seems a little difficult at times, for there are very few places anywhere else in the world where you can find as much sheer natural beauty as in these unlikely volcanic mountains that have arisen from the sea. Mark Twain visited Hawaii more than a century ago, and even then he said that it was the loveliest fleet of islands to be anchored in any ocean. We're back to sea, this time sailing out over the eastern Pacific en route to the state of California. In the early pre-dawn hours, these men, the unseen heroes of the QE2, are busy at work in the world's largest floating kitchens, preparing meals fit for a king. This is the pastry kitchen, and long before the passengers arise, these men are busy preparing to destroy your waistline. Down here on Seven Deck, these men deal not only in quality, but quantity as well. Seven and a half thousand meals a day are served on the QE2, and that adds up to over a half a million meals for the full world cruise, and provisions must be ordered just right. On Eight Deck, in the butcher shop, steaks are being prepared for the evening meal. All meat for the world cruise is purchased in U.S. ports of call. But fruits and vegetables are bought throughout the world cruise. Executive chef John Bainbridge will inspect each crate as it arrives on the pier. He must make sure that the quality is correct as well as the quantity, because if he puts an item on the menu, he has to have enough on board to serve anyone who may request it. And the result of all of this work? Well, let's find out what it's like to have a fine meal in the Columbia dining room with a pleasant couple, Greg and Maggie McIntyre. Once the initial menu selections have been made, a wine is chosen from the QE2 sellers. And for the first course, what could be more appropriate than caviar? One of the QE2's greatest distinctions is the fact that this ship consumes 10% of the entire world's annual production of beluga caviar. They literally bring it on board the ship in 100-pound cases. And for the main course, tonight we're going to have a QE2 specialty, Beef Wellington. This delicious pastry-wrapped entree is not on the menu tonight. Greg and Maggie have ordered it especially for the occasion. Cunard chefs will not only prepare anything you request, they actively encourage it. On 24 hours notice, they can and will prepare anything from bird's nest soup to a pizza. And for dessert, anything your heart desires. Tonight, Flaming Cherry's Jubilee. Dining at sea is truly one of life's most elegant experiences. And to dine and live this way for 80 days is very special indeed. 
As Greg and Maggie relax to a short serenade, we steam out over the Pacific en route to our next port of call, the city of the angels, Los Angeles, L.A. The fountains sparkle at Century City. We are in Southern California, the land of palm trees, orange groves, freeways, the Sunset Strip, and of course, Hollywood. Yes, for everything else Southern California offers, the world still thinks first of Hollywood. From the great studios of this city have come the entertainment the world loves most, the movies. And this is the town that movies built. On Hollywood Boulevard stands a world-renowned landmark, the famous Chinese Theater. Its courtyard filled with footprints and handprints of the stars embedded in concrete. And on the boulevard out front, the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Thousands and thousands of bronze stars immortalizing those people who have contributed so much to the entertainment of the world. But while Hollywood may come first to mind, the Los Angeles area's greatest tourist attraction is of course this, the Magic Kingdom Disneyland. Americans tend to take this fabulous place for granted, but the rest of the world considers this a major tourist destination in and of itself. And for QE2's international passengers, they regarded their visit here today to be as important as their visit to the Taj Mahal. And if you have never been to this wonderful spot before, I urge you to put it at the top of your list. It is one of the most joyous, fun-filled places on earth, and a living tribute to a man who spent his life making millions of people happy, Walt Disney. From Los Angeles, we now steam south along the coast of Baja to the sunny city of Acapulco. This is the classic Mexican resort, a necklace of hundreds of hotels around the famous Acapulco Bay. And among Acapulco's notable attractions is this, Quebrada, a tidal gorge where the surf crashes into the jagged rocks. Each afternoon, tourists gather here at the El Mirador Hotel to watch young Mexicans take the 130-foot plunge into the churning waters below. From the El Mirador Hotel, we now head out to the Las Brisas District. Most world cruise passengers will skip Acapulco sightseeing and will instead head to the luxury hotels and resorts. The Las Brisas Hotel, south of Acapulco, is one of the finest hotels in the world. Each room has its own private, individual swimming pool and also a private pink jeep that you can use to take you and your family to the beach for swimming, snorkeling, or Acapulco's most fun-filled activity, which is this. This man is being strapped into a harness. The harness is attached to a parachute in back and a ski boat in front. Put it all together, and this is what you get. Acapulco, it's one of the great international resorts of the world. And we have just enough time to make our touchdown, slip out of our parachute harness, and catch the last tender back to the ship. Because tonight at sunset, the QE2 will steam south along the Central American coast in some of the most pleasant weather of our cruise. Most passengers will use this opportunity to relax out on the decks but you might prefer to use the time to do a little bit of shopping. The QE2 has nine different shops on board, offering a wide array of duty-free merchandise. The ship sells everything from liquor and cigarettes to ordinary drugstore items, moderately priced souvenirs, as well as high-quality jewelry, jade, porcelain, Waterford crystal, and Royal Worcester china. The prices, if not bargains, are at least reasonable, and it's a pleasant, fun way to shop and spend an afternoon at sea. A 
And in the evening, well, the fun continues. Tonight in the Grand Lounge, Roy and Jackie Todoff present another one of their colorful reviews. Cunard as a steamship company offers many different things, but the sheer size of this ship and the number of passengers aboard afford the line the luxury of presenting some of the most lively and colorful shows at sea. After the show, will you have many different choices? Dancing to the Joe Loss Orchestra, the Midnight Buffet, or you might like to try your hand at Lady Luck in one of the world's most elegant casinos. Here at QE2 passengers try their hand at the roulette wheel, the blackjack tables, and of course, the slot machines. And if you don't know how to play these games of chance, the ship offers classes to teach you the basics. The stakes can be low, and if you have enough common sense not to lose too much, or the sheer brilliance to quit while you're ahead, it can be fun and a part of the entertainment at sea. The casino stays open almost until dawn, but at dawn today very few people will be asleep. For as the sun starts to rise on this our 72nd day at sea, we are beginning our trip through the big ditch, the Panama Canal. For the next eight hours we will thrill to one of the greatest engineering wonders of the world. The statistics of lives and deaths, hopes and disease, hard work and money that went into creating this canal contrast sharply with the peaceful serenity today as we approach the Miraflores locks on the Pacific side. Here the ship will be raised 54 feet in the first stage of a complex journey. The QE2 is the largest liner in the world to ever go through the Panama Canal. Clearance is as close as 18 inches in some of the chambers. Eight engines, known as mules, will pull the ship through the locks in a journey that will cost the Cunard Line $100,000. The QE2 pays the highest toll of any ship in the world. By contrast, the lowest toll ever paid was 36 cents by Richard Halliburton in 1928 when he swam through the canal. Once the Pedro Miguel and Miraflores locks are cleared, the QE2 will move across Gatun Lake, a 31-mile man-made lake that connects the Atlantic and Pacific locks. And on the far side of the lake, we will enter the Gatun Locks. Over the next two hours, the ship will be lowered a total of 85 feet through three complex chambers. Passengers and crew members stand on the decks of the QE2 to watch this incredible machinery that has served shipping lines of the world since 1914, when the American government completed this project that had defeated the original French Canal Company. Inside the lock room at Gatun, we see some of the behind-the-scenes operations of the Panama Canal. Gauges, dials, and instruments record the opening and closing of gates and the rise and fall of water levels in the various chambers. On the blackboard, all of the ships at sea awaiting passage are listed. And if you look closely, you'll see our name. There we are, the Queen Elizabeth II, sandwiched between a tanker and a freighter. The people working in the lock room keep in constant contact by telephone with the other chambers to monitor the movement of ships through the canal. And outside, the mules are pulling the QE2 through another chamber as 67,000 tons of steel glide into the final lock. And once the last chamber is cleared, the gates are closed behind and the QE2 is once again out to sea. From the Panama Canal, we now steam along the northern coast of South America, en route to our next port of call, the city of Cartagena, on the coast of Colombia. Cartagena was the center of the Spanish Main. The city was founded in 1533 by the Spanish and developed quickly as the riches of the Spanish explorers grew. 
Today the city still has the feel of an old Spanish town. The courtyards, the cannons, the fort and the city walls all create a sense of history here on the Colombian coast. The people who populate Cartagena today reflect all of the different ethnic groups who have made this city what it is. The blacks, the Spanish and the Indians have all blended together through 400 years of history to create an interesting racial group that populates the northern coast of Colombia today. But for cruise passengers, Cartagena means considerably more than history. It also means emeralds, for this is the emerald capital of the world. And the shops of this city are very busy today as passengers search out one final, last, and great world cruise souvenir. From Cartagena, we now move into the Caribbean and the island of Curaçao. Curaçao is a part of the Dutch Antilles. Its capital is Willemstad. The language is a form of Dutch, the architecture is gabled, and visually you'd swear that you were standing right in the center of Holland. But the atmosphere is pure Caribbean. Warm, lazy, quiet, and a favorite spot with Americans searching out some of the winter sun. Curaçao does have an economy based on industry. In fact, Royal Dutch Shell sends so much oil out of this island's refinery that Curaçao is now the fifth busiest port in the world. But the island women still buy their fruits and vegetables from schooners moored in the center of town. These schooners sail over from the coast of Venezuela each day to sell their fresh produce here in the center of Willemstad. Curaçao does have one export you might be familiar with. It's made from these small, bitter oranges. They're harvested, peeled, and then thrown away. It's the peels that are saved. Using a secret process, the peels are then dried and fermented into the world-famous Curaçao liqueur. And the entire world production of Curaçao liqueur comes from this, the back porch of a small house on the edge of Willemstad. To describe the operation as small is an understatement, but the quality isn't, and Curaçao liqueur has long been regarded as one of the best in the world by liqueur connoisseurs. From Curaçao, we now steam back through the Caribbean, first to Port Everglades, where we will debark many of our passengers, and then on to New York City, our final port of call on the great world cruise. This is the quiet time of the cruise as the QE2 steams northward through the calm and peaceful waters of the Caribbean Sea. On the bridge, Captain Peter Jackson charts our course through the narrow reefs and channels of the Caribbean. This is Captain Jackson's 44th year at sea he is the master of one of the last great ships of the world, and it is his responsibility to guide us safely home on this final leg of the great world cruise. This is the lazy part of the trip, a time to tone up that tan you've been working on for 80 days, to finish reading that book that you started back in Hong Kong, to play one last game of shuffleboard, or overindulge yourself in one final meal on the noon buffet. And it's also a good time to exchange phone numbers and addresses with all of your newfound friends and reflect on just what all of this has meant. To many people, a world cruise may seem like a frivolous extravagance, a pampered world of luxury, and hardly the place for a serious traveler. But I came away with a very different impression. For to me, these were the great world travelers, for they have experienced the world on all of its different planes. From the streets of India at dawn to the glittering nights in the showrooms at sea, these people have experienced life, the world, and themselves in every possible way. They have grown, they have been enriched, and they have learned to look at their own lives in a very new and in a very different fashion. And on the morning of the 80th and final day of the Great World Cruise, there it is, the Battery, New York City.
In the New York Harbor, Lady Liberty herself welcomes us home. And so if you are like I am, and you measure a person's wealth not by the possessions that they own, but by the experiences that they have had, then these are truly the richest people in the world. Richer for having seen the world, and I hope that you too are richer for having been on board for the great world cruise of the QE2.